The sweltering heat of a July summer night was unusual for Millville, New Jersey. As a reporter, I've covered numerous stories, but none so chilling, so drenched in mystery as the death of Tiffany Valiante. It was not just the suddenness of her passing that had the community whispering, it was the strange, almost otherworldly circumstances surrounding it. On that fateful night, I was returning home from a local assignment, the streets were quiet, save for the distant hum of a freight train passing through. The news came to me as a jolt, almost as an afterthought, during a casual check of my phone. Local 25-year-old found dead under mysterious circumstances, the notification blinked. Intrigued and sensing a deeper story, I steered my car towards the Valiante household. Upon arrival, the scene was already swarmed with police cars, their red and blue lights painting the neighborhood in eerie colors. I approached cautiously, my recorder in hand, ready to capture every detail. The police were tight-lipped, but the sorrow in their eyes spoke volumes. It was clear, this was no ordinary incident. The house itself was a modest one-story, nestled against a backdrop of towering oaks that seemed to whisper amongst themselves. The lawn was unkempt, with wildflowers and grass reaching up in tangled disarray, as if in protest of the somber mood. I noticed a small group of neighbors gathered across the street, their faces drawn and anxious. As I crossed the road, the crunch of gravel underfoot seemed deafening. One of the neighbors, a middle-aged woman with salt and pepper hair, noticed my approach. Her eyes, red from crying, met mine with a mix of suspicion and hope. Are you here to find out what really happened? She asked, her voice barely above a whisper. Nodding, I introduced myself and asked her to share anything she might know. It's all so strange, she began her hands nervously twisting a handkerchief. Tiffany was such a vibrant, loving girl. It doesn't make sense. Last evening, she was fine, laughing in her backyard. And then, just hours later, she's gone. The story grew more perplexing as more neighbors shared their accounts. Reports of strange lights in the sky that night a sudden cold gust that swept through the neighborhood, and a series of unexplained noises were just the beginning. But it was the condition of Tiffany's room that sent shivers down my spine. When I finally got access, it was as if a whirlwind had passed through. Furniture was overturned, books and ornaments scattered about, and in the center of it all, the window wide open as if beckoning the night inside. Yet, there was no sign of forced entry, no sign of a struggle. My investigation took me deeper into the fabric of Millville, uncovering old legends and recent whispers of paranormal occurrences. Locals spoke of a cursed land, of spirits unrest, and of a dark history hidden beneath the town's placid surface. Each piece added to a tapestry of ghostly apparitions and inexplicable events, pointing to a supernatural influence. As I pieced together the story, night fell once again. The moon, a slender crescent, cast a pale glow over the town. The air was charged, as if anticipating the uncovering of a truth long buried. What secrets did this town hold? What had really happened to Tiffany Valiante? My phone buzzed, a reminder of the deadline looming over me. I needed to get back, to write up my findings, yet something pulled me back, whispering that the story was far from over. As I stood there, the wind picked up, rustling through the trees, carrying with it a voice, or perhaps a warning. The tale of Tiffany Valiante was far from finished, and I knew, deep down, that this was only the beginning. As the wind whispered through the trees, I felt a chill run down my spine. The story of Tiffany Valiante was unraveling like a thread in a dark, endless tapestry. Standing at the edge of the forest that bordered her family's property, I could see why the locals whispered about the land being cursed. 
The trees loomed, their branches clawing at the sky as if trying to snatch something unseen. I returned to the scene where the police had cordoned off her house. A detective, who had been following the case closely, noticed my prolonged interest and approached. You're the reporter, right? He asked, his voice low and tired. There's something about this case that doesn't sit right with me, he confessed. His eyes scanned the perimeter as if he expected the shadows to start moving. We've had our fair share of tragedies, he continued, his flashlight beam dancing across the ground. But this, he paused, shaking his head, this is different. It's as if the very air breathes malice. I nodded, understanding his sentiment all too well. The atmosphere was thick, heavy with an unspoken dread that seemed to suffocate the truth. As we spoke, a gust of wind sent a shiver through the trees, their leaves rustling like the whispers of the departed. Did you hear about the apparition seen the night she died? The detective suddenly asked, his voice barely above a whisper. My interest peaked. I urged him to continue. Several neighbors reported seeing a figure, a shadow really, fleeting and almost mist-like. It appeared around the house just before the incident, he revealed. Intrigued by this new information, I decided to visit these neighbors. The first, an elderly lady named Mrs. Thompson, lived two doors down. Her house, much like her, seemed to hold many secrets, its walls lined with old, faded photographs of Millville in days gone by. She welcomed me with a wary smile, offering a cup of tea which I accepted gratefully. As we sat in her dimly lit living room, the curtains fluttered slightly, as if caught by an indoor breeze. It's the spirits, Mrs. Thompson said matter-of-factly, noticing my gaze. They've been restless ever since that poor girl died. Her hands trembled as she recounted her experience. It was late, just past midnight. I was looking out my window at the moon when I saw it, a dark figure, tall and thin, moving through the trees towards Tiffany's house. Her story sent chills through me. It wasn't just the content, but the conviction in her voice. It was clear she believed every word she said, and in that dimly lit room, so did I. Leaving Mrs. Thompson's house, I felt a heavy weight on my shoulders. The night seemed darker, the shadows deeper. My next stop was the local library. If there was any truth to the tales of curses and haunted lands, the old town records might hold some clues. The librarian, a middle-aged man with an apparent interest in local history, was more than willing to help. You're looking into the Valiante case? He asked, his curiosity piqued as he led me to a secluded section of the library. We pored over old newspapers and land deeds, the musty smell of aged paper filling the air. Hours slipped by as we delved into the past. That's when I stumbled upon it, a faded article from over a century ago about a tragic incident that occurred on the very land the Valiante house now stood. A family had vanished without a trace, their disappearance giving birth to rumors of a curse that many believed lingered. Armed with this new information, I felt a mix of excitement and dread. The pieces of the puzzle were slowly fitting together forming a picture more sinister than I had anticipated. Night had fallen by the time I left the library. The streets of Millville were deserted, the only sound my footsteps echoing in the empty night. As I walked the deserted streets of Millville, the echo of my footsteps was soon joined by another sound, soft, almost imperceptible at first. It was a whispering, like leaves rustling but there were no trees nearby. The air grew colder, a fog began to roll in, shrouding the streetlights in a ghostly halo. My heart raced, the back of my neck prickled with the unmistakable feeling of being watched. I quickened my pace, the documents from the library clutched tightly under my arm. 
The article about the vanished family had opened a new avenue of inquiry, one that promised answers but also hinted at dangers unseen. The notion of a curse was no longer just an old wife's tale. It felt real, palpable, breathing down my neck. Turning a corner, I came upon the old Millville Cemetery. The gates were ajar, creaking softly as the wind nudged them. An inexplicable pull drew me toward them. Inside, the fog was thicker, enveloping the gravestones in a soft, white shroud. My flashlight beam seemed feeble, swallowed up by the dense mist. I wandered among the tombstones, reading the names of those long past. It was here, in the city of the dead, that I hoped to find a clue, something overlooked, something that tied the land's tragic past to Tiffany's untimely demise. A sudden noise, a soft thud behind a large mausoleum, made me freeze. Heart pounding, I edged around the corner, flashlight poised. There, illuminated by the shaky beam, was a figure. It was crouched low to the ground, its back to me. Slowly, it turned, and I could see its face, or rather, where its face should have been. It was blank, smooth, featureless like the fog itself. I stumbled back, my breath catching in my throat. The figure rose, towering over me, and as it did, the air grew oppressively cold. I know what you seek, it whispered, its voice a chilling caress that seemed to echo from the graves themselves. But some truths are better left buried. With that, it faded into the mist, leaving me alone with the whistling wind and the whispering voices of the dead. Shaken, I left the cemetery, my mind racing. The encounter had been real, I was sure of it, but who or what had I seen? As I made my way back to my car, the fog began to lift, but the chill remained, a cold reminder of the night's revelations. The drive home was a blur, a montage of streetlights and shadows. When I arrived, I locked the door behind me, my mind still reeling from the night's events. I spread out the old documents on my dining table, pouring over them by the light of a single lamp. The story they told was one of sorrow and darkness, of a land cursed not by superstition, but by a tangible malevolence. As I read, the whispering started again, this time inside my own house. It was softer now, almost coaxing. Glancing up, I noticed something I hadn't before, a figure, standing just outside my window, watching. I froze the hairs on my neck standing on end. It was back, the faceless apparition from the cemetery. The phone rang suddenly, startling me. I answered it hesitantly. Leave Melville, a voice hissed, then the line went dead. My heart thumped in my chest as I stared out into the darkness. The figure was gone now, but the message was clear. The story I was unraveling was dangerous, deeper, and darker than I had ever imagined. Yet, I couldn't leave, not now. I was too close to the truth, whatever peril it might bring. I had to continue, to follow where the story led, even if it led into the shadows of the unknown. The night was long, and the whispers grew louder, urging me on deeper into the heart of the mystery surrounding Tiffany Valiante's death. The whispers continued to grow, surrounding me like a cloak woven from threads of dread. I could no longer tell if the voices were from within or pressing in from the shadow-laden corners of my room. My only light, the weak glow of the lamp, seemed to flicker with each new whisper, as if the darkness itself was trying to snuff it out. As I sat, Frozen by fear and curiosity, the air around me thickened. The room temperature dropped, my breath visible in ragged clouds. Then, the walls began to creak, the old house groaning under the weight of its hidden secrets. Pictures on the walls started to swing lightly, as if nudged by an unseen hand. Reveal, the voices hissed, 
now clear and commanding. My hands shook as I picked up one last document, a journal hidden among the town's archives, long forgotten. It belonged to a woman who had lived on the land before the Valiantes, before the town had even been a shadow on the map. Her words were scrawled in frantic, looping handwriting, the ink faded but the fear palpable. She wrote of the land, of its hunger for sorrow and its thirst for despair. She spoke of a shadow that walked without wind, a darkness that whispered promises of peace only to devour any light. She believed the land needed to be sealed, its power contained. Her last entry was a plea, a hope that someone would find the journal and finish what she could not. I knew what I had to do. The figure outside my window, the whispers, the journal, they were all guiding me towards an inevitable confrontation with the darkness. Armed with nothing but the journal and a desperate need to protect others from the fate that befell Tiffany, I left my house, heading back to the heart of it all, the Valiantes' land. The night was oppressive, the stars hidden behind a veil of clouds, the moon a mere sliver of silver in the sky. As I approached the property, the figure appeared again, its faceless gaze fixed upon me. It didn't move to stop me, but rather, it seemed to beckon me forward, towards the backyard where Tiffany's life had so abruptly ended. There, in the very heart of the yard, I found it, a well, old and covered, nearly swallowed by the earth itself. The ground around it was soft, the grass unnaturally green and vibrant. The air pulsed with a palpable energy, a heartbeat of something ancient and malevolent. Opening the journal to the last page, I read the woman's final words aloud. They were not just words, but a chant, a seal, a binding. The wind rose, howling like the cries of the damned, the ground beneath me trembling. The figure moved closer, its presence overwhelming, but its power seemed to wane with each word I spoke. With the final word, a scream tore through the night, not from the figure, but from the earth itself. The well's cover trembled, then shattered, a light bursting forth, not dark, but brilliantly golden, searing the night with its purity. The figure recoiled, its form disintegrating before my eyes, a wail of defeat carried away by the wind. As the light faded, the night returned to stillness, the stars peeking out from behind their veils. The land felt lighter, as if a great weight had been lifted. The woman's words had sealed the darkness away, her plea answered by a stranger centuries later. I returned home as the sun began to rise, the horrors of the night behind me, the whispers silenced. The story of Tiffany Valiante and the curse of the land would live on, but no longer would it claim the lives of the innocent. I had come seeking a story, and I left with a legacy, a tale of shadows, light, and the unyielding power of hope. As the dawn painted the sky with hues of gold and pink, I knew that while the darkness may return, there would always be light to meet it, to fight it, and to prevail.